that started a, take money from them. Uh, and they all been abusing the Chris protest. Some people remember Chris from Crew Week when he came in and kind of laid the foundation for this specifically strong focus uh, um, to talk about budgeting and financial planning. So he's going to continue that conversation. There'll be a little bit more of a practical push on this. So there, there'll be a worksheet that you'll become a part of this in a little bit when he asks us to pass that out. The thing that Kim's passing out is we have one class on May 1st that we have ideas that we what we can do with that session, but if there's things that you feel like I was coming into this class and I had hopes that we would talk about this, um, we would love to capture those thoughts. So that's the goal of this little half sheet. So if you wouldn't mind to make some notes on that and then we'll pick it up after class to um, kind of help us shape that last class on May 1st. But for now, let's get started for Chris. Thank him for coming in and coming back from Florida in time to do this. Thank you. Thank you for that course of <laughs> um, Remind me, how many of you are here, or not here, downstairs? No, we're, we're, we're in library. Yeah, we're in library a few weeks ago when I was here. Okay, and you came back for more. Okay, so for the most part, we got um, some new, new faces, so it's cool. Um, I'm here to primarily talk to you about budgeting, and a lot of times when you say uh, that word, there's like a collective groan that comes out, because it's just a lot of times it's not one of the funnest things to talk about, but it's, it's critical. And I, if you can get off to a good start with that, and with a show of hands, how many of you are graduating? Okay. Yeah. So this is going to become real here in a couple months. Um, and I was just talking to Mr. Tayworth about this. Um, it, it, a lot of the stuff that you learn, it, it, really in college period, doesn't really become real until you actually have something to apply it to. So when you start getting a paycheck, something that's maybe a little more substantial or a little more regular than maybe the odd job here or there, the babysitting or the whatever that you might be doing, um, all of a sudden it becomes really important to start off and have a good foundation. So that's really what this is. And I hope, I don't, I don't think you're going to become experts on all of this today. That would be crazy. But I hope that you can kind of think back on this or refer back to this at some point and at least have something that uh, a light kind of turns on. Uh, I was just sharing too, I've got an 18 year old daughter who's planning on getting uh, a job this summer that should you know, pay her more than she's used to getting. And her first question was, she's like, Dad, what do I do with this once I get it? And my jaw just about hit the floor because we talk about these things, we're a little nerdy in our house. We talk about stuff like this all the time, all the time, all the time. And once we got back into it, she was like, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot. That, that's what I need to do. You know, that's how I need to set these things up. So again, you're not gonna be an expert today, but if it can be that light bulb that turns on once you get that paycheck and you go, okay, what do I do with this? I, I feel like I'm rich. And maybe you can think back to some of these things. That's the goal, okay? And then I, I shared this with when, when I was here a few weeks ago. In the 40-ish minutes that I've got to share with you, I would hope now, there's going to be times that I know you zone out and you look out the window and you think, when is the sun going to come and when can I go see my girlfriend or boyfriend? And you're going to think about other things. I would hope that during this 40 minutes, you, you, you focus in and you could get at least one thing. One thing that you can really like drill down into your memory that is, is really, I'll say life-changing, that you can really apply. Um, that's the goal, I think. Anytime you sit in a, a class that you get really one thing, you can tell what kind of student I was, right, when I was here? <laughs> one thing. Once I get my one thing, I might as well leave. Um, but no, you want to get one thing, and if you can really get that and have that be something that uh, you take with you, or you, that you take with you, I think it's a successful class. So that's what I'm hoping you get today, okay? And I hope, hopefully I've got a lot of one things in here that you can use, okay? The goal, like I said, is to build a strong foundation, and, and I, this picture is great. I don't care really how well this house is built. It looks like it's a pretty shoddy kind of structure. But it doesn't matter what's happening below there and how fast those currents are coming and probably what other storms come around that. This house is built on an incredible, like look at that rock or boulder, whatever that is. I don't even know, but that thing is solid. And so if you have a great foundation, it doesn't matter what's going on around you, you're going to be able to weather a lot of those storms. So that's really what I want to show you today. And here's, here's a representation. I use this so much, whether I'm working with a person who's 18 years old or a person who's 98 years old, I, I show them this. 
And I think if you're able to structure your financial house this way, so if you can picture this, this triangle maybe sitting, you know, uh, sitting on that, that rock, okay? So this triangle is, is that house. Um, that, that's, I think, a good visual. And I, I don't want to get a lot into this right now, but the thing I want to show you, again, real life stuff, I just showed somebody this this morning and I was talking to them. Um, but I, I, I'm going to tell you, I think there's four cornerstones to your financial house. And we're not going to get a lot into each one of these today, but one of those is right down here. It's a budget. You need to have a budget in place. You've got to have a plan for how much, you know, knowing how much money you have coming in and how am I going to spend each one of those dollars. You have to allocate and, you know, have a, have a plan for how each one of those dollars are, are allocated. And if you do, that provides just a great base so you can do everything else uh, you build on top of that. You know, having cash reserves in place, we'll talk a little bit about that, and having you know, money aside for some long-term savings goal, you've got to be able to have a good foundation in place. So that's really what the budget does. That's one of those cornerstones, and that's why we talk about that. And then, you know, Scripture has so many great things to say about finances, and I think this is a great budgeting. You don't find the word budget in Scripture here, but this is a great verse in Proverbs. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, but it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Right? Ants even, I mean, that's a way of budgeting. They gather food while they've got it, and they don't eat it all in the summer. Right? They pack it away so they know during the winter time and the times when there's less food, they're, they're able to pull out some of their stores and take care of themselves. It's a it's an ant budget, right? So there you go. Uh, scripture just has so many great things to say. And here's some real basics before we get down into some uh, real specific kind of things. And, and, and I'm going to preface this too by saying if, if you've got a question in the next few minutes, I would much rather spend time going through hopefully some answers to your question uh, than just going through what I have. I've got more than enough I could share for a long time. But chances are, if you're thinking of something or I, something that I'm sharing doesn't quite make sense, or how does that apply to me, just just ask. More than likely, somebody else is thinking that same thing, and I think that's a very valuable use of time. Um, but here's some basics, and this is this is really in an even a more basic way I shared with my daughter. Um, what do you do? Budgeting, budgeting basics. Number one, you give give back to the Lord's work, right? That's number one. Once you get some dollars, you get you give back. Number two, you, you, set a, or you, you set in place a plan to eliminate any debt that you have. Okay, and we're going to get down a little more into these. Establish an emergency fund. And then once you do those things, then you start thinking longer term. Then you start thinking about the more, um, the fun stuff, right? Some of that stuff is, you know, it's not, you know, I shouldn't say that. Some of that can be really fun. Giving can be a blast. But, you know, it's not um, some of the things you generally think about. A lot of times people think, I get a paycheck and I'm going to buy a car. And I'm going to, you know, do all the great things, go on vacations and do all of those things. Um, and those are all great if you do them, do them in order. Okay? So those, those, are the, those are some of the beginning basics. And now, why, why do you follow that above order? Why is that important? Um, giving is a tangible way to demonstrate our reliance on the Lord. So we recognize by giving that everything, every good thing comes from him. Everything comes from the Lord, our ability to earn an income, the job that he provided us with, the great HR person that I interviewed with. You know, thank goodness I didn't get to have to sit in front of a grumpy, grumpy person. They, uh, I got a great person to interview with. And just all those things, it all comes from the Lord. And by you giving back, um, it demonstrates <coughs> your uh, thankfulness, reliance on, on him. And, and, and ultimately, you're saying, I'm giving money away that I know is so doggone hard to earn, but I know by giving that away, he's going to provide provide all that I need in some way. Okay? And then Proverbs 22, 7 is a great verse, but ultimately it says any debt that I have, so we're giving first, then we're eliminating debt. Debt makes you a slave to the lender. I don't know if any of you have had an experience with this. Have, have, have any of you um, received a loan or borrowed money from somebody that you love, somebody that's close to you, a friend or a family member. Have you done that? And you don't have to say this. I've done this, okay? And I don't know if your experience has been the same. I borrowed some money from my father-in-law, who's as generous a person as there is in the world. 
and never was there any doubt in his mind that I was going to pay those dollars back. But every time I saw him, it changed our relationship. It was different. He wasn't my father-in-law anymore. The first thing I saw, it was probably more on me, was, oh, he's my, he's my lender now. You know, I, I need to pay him back. I want to pay him back. Because all I could think in my mind is that he's thinking, when is Chris going to pay me my dollars back? You know, and I know that wasn't the case, but it, it changed it changed that relationship. Okay? And I think Proverbs is right on where it says you're a slave to that lender. You're, you're, you're indebted to that person, right? And so you want to get that eliminated as quickly as you can. And then the other thing that we had in place there was, is setting up an emergency fund. Um, and I think I'm going to get to this here in a second. Yeah. But without an emergency fund, if you don't have those dollars in place to care for an emergency, you have to pay for that emergency, whatever it is. Um, I just had, I'll tell you a great story. You don't care about this, but it's perfect. I was dropping one of my daughters off to school this morning, and a young man backed into my minivan and just blew a hole in my bumper. Just this morning? Just this morning. Yeah, so I get to deal with that. That's always fun. Yeah. Just called his mom just a little bit ago and told her about it, so I broke the news to her. And it was just a mess. It's his birthday today. That was his birthday present. Back in my van. And so the bottom line here, somebody somehow has to fix my van. We're going to try to do it without insurance so we don't have to mess with that. So they, after I get an estimate, are going to have to come up with probably $1,000 to fix my bumper. That's where an emergency fund comes into place. They're not counting on that happening. That wasn't supposed to happen this morning, but it's got to be cared for. What can they do? They can put it on their credit card, but you don't want to do that because what does it do? It drives you further into debt. It kind of messes up your budget because now you've got this expense you weren't counting on. Um, so you want to have funds set aside to take care of that kind of emergency so you don't go further into debt. Okay? Isn't that fun? Story time. <laughs> um, okay, so an emergency fund. Have you guys talked about this in any of your classes? Yeah. You're experts on this. Okay, we'll fly through this. Um, why have an emergency fund? Pay your bills without having to borrow, right? Whatever that emergency is that comes up, you're able to tackle those. Um, any major expenditures, so the furnace quits, you, your car poops out. Um, help to avoid some of the stress of an unexpected emergency situation. So, you know, if you don't have those dollars in place, all you can think about is, how am I going to care for this? How am I going to care for that? And what does that do? It affects your relationship with your spouse. It affects your relationship with your employer. You know, you're just not yourself. It just kind of emotionally messes you up. But if you've got those dollars set aside, it's okay. You know, things happen. I know the Lord's in control. I've got those dollars set aside to care for that. It's okay. So all reasons to have, have an emergency fund in place. And you guys probably have this. Um, and, and I'm a huge, huge Dave Ramsey fan. You guys gone through some of his materials. I mean, this is this a lot of this just comes from from him. Um, totally stole it. <laughs> so, uh, emergency fund guideline. You should probably aim to have 10% if you can. Work this into your budget. And again, we'll get specifics here. But set aside 10% um, to to get you to a point. So you have three to six months worth of your living expenses cared for, right? So if you're used to living on $2,000 a month, that's what you kind of built your financial house on, how much should you have set aside in an emergency fund? Six to 12. 12. Oh. Yeah. So it's three to six months. So if it's, if it's three months, three times $2,000 is $6,000. So six to $12,000 you should aim to have set aside in some account that's there specifically for emergencies. It's not there to take a trip. It's not there to you know, do anything else with other than sit there and give you the peace of mind that comes with knowing if some emergency comes up, I've got it taken care of. And you're not gonna do it overnight, so that's why you work that into your budget you know, and set that aside uh, bit by bit till you get to that point where you've got that set aside. And some of the easiest ways to do it is if you can just have it automatically deducted from a paycheck <coughs> through some electronic way, kind of out of sight, out of mind, before you know it, it's, it's, you've got it built up. Because it's always hard to take those dollars or to write out a check and actually get rid of those funds. So if you, if you get rid of it before, uh, before you even have it, that's a good way to make it happen. There you go. Okay, everybody laugh. My son's at humor. There you go. Everybody needs to plan. Uh, use Tombstone. There's somebody named Homer Hendel Bergen. Okay, there you go. I heard one laugh, so we'll move on. Not everybody needs to plan, but most people do. Now, here would be if we have those budgeting sheets, 
uh, this would be a good time to use these. And there are so many ways of setting up a budget and so many uh, guidelines that you can use. So this isn't the be all end all. I think it's a good way. And your situation could be completely different than this. Um, you know, the way you, when you graduate or when you, just the way, oh, thank you. When you have your, um, you've got a job and you've got an income and your living situation could be totally different. But I, I would say this is pretty normal. This is pretty average, okay? And I know, help me with this. I, I think you guys were going to find or did find or you should know kind of a starting point in the career that you're choosing, right? You guys should, should have a pretty good idea, right? Yeah. If I'm you, did, did they, is this filled out already? Have you guys done, haven't done anything? You, brand new stuff. Yeah. Okay. That's great. You guys are so excited today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. Um, so what you would want to do, and I don't know that you have to do this right now. You can if you want. Paper's, paper's cheap, I suppose you could, if you wanted to get another one of these, you can. Um, put in your income, you know, whatever income it is you're expecting there. And I, once you go down the, the line here, so the top line is your income. Um, and then what I think is important to do is de de be real. Know that if you're making $50,000 a year, is your paycheck going to be $50,000 a year? No. No. You're getting a whole lot deducted for a whole lot of reasons. Some of them are good, and some of them you just complain about, and they're still not good. But you have to pay taxes. Uh, I was just talking with Mr. Melton about this. If you're fortunate that you when, you, when you graduate, you get a job offer from an employer that's willing to pay for your health insurance, or that's willing to put money aside for your retirement plan, or some other nice benefit, awesome. I mean, that's as good, almost as good as actually having money in your paycheck if they're willing to do that. I just, I shared with Mr. Melton, my employer uh, pays me a salary, and on top of that, um, they pay for a part of my health insurance benefits, but I'm still responsible for about uh, just short of $600 a month that I have to pay for my family and I to have health insurance. And sometimes I, I'm in that mode of think, saying, man, what a rotten deal that is, that I've gotta pay $600 a month because um, I start thinking, man, if I had that $600 a month, I could do a whole lot more with that. Um, but I'm grateful that they're subsidizing that plan in a very big way. So all that to say, if, if you have two jobs that are equal in, in salary, and one's willing to pay more for health insurance benefits, or one's willing to give you a benefit that isn't salary, boy, that's, that's, worth, that's worth a whole lot, okay? But for, for, for what we're doing here, I, this is just a rough, rough and dirty kind of estimate. For t I put taxes and all the other stuff. I would say if you're deducting 20%, I think that's good. That's pretty normal. So if you're making, if you put $50,000 in here, you're deducting 20%, what does that come out to be? $10,000, right? So you're left on the line in the black box with $40,000, okay? And is that accurate? Is that gonna be, take that to the bank happening for everybody? No, not at all. But I think it's best when you do something like this, I think it's best to estimate low on the top line and estimate high on the second line. So if you think you're gonna make $50,000 a year, put in 45,000. If you think you're only gonna pay 15% in taxes and all the other expenses, put 20% in, right? So if it comes out better, you're gonna be really super surprised and, and happy. Okay, so far so good with that. Now here's the big debate, at least among people who like to give and how you should give. The first thing you should do, and remember from our basics, was, was giving. I think it's so important to give. Give, give, give. And give to the place where you are receiving your spiritual nurturing, your spiritual food. Give to your church. That's for most people. It's giving back to your local church. I think that's so important for all the reasons we had talked about. And some people say, do I give 10% off of my gross income? Do I give it off of my net income? For this, for this budget, I have you giving off of your net income. And I don't know why we did that. Um, it's a it's a super personal decision. I tell you, if, you, if people are very honest and they say, How, are you giving off 10% off of your net or your gross? Most people would tell you in a very honest place, I'm not giving 10%, you know? Most people don't do it, right? And if you wanna be successful, you generally wanna do what most people are not doing because most people aren't doing 
this kind of thing correctly. So in some way, if, if, in, in your personal moment, time with the Lord, in some way, if you're giving, it, this is just a, a tangible way of you saying, I trust you, Lord, and I'm going to give. Give 10%. If it's of, of your gross, that's awesome. Yeah. You can't outgive the Lord, right? Amen. You, you can't out -give. There we go. That's, mm -hmm. You should be in the front row. <laughs> 10%. So and if it's off of your net, that's great too. But just do something that's a, I think it's a stretch, right? Because when you start adding up those dollars and you start thinking, man, 10% of, if it's $50,000, that's $5,000 a year, 400 and some dollars a month. Man, I could do a whole lot with $400 a month. But that's, again, it demonstrates your reliance on the Lord. So 10% should be given. Okay, 10% should be savings. And this is savings just for long-term Savings, just money that I am going to set aside and I'm almost going to forget about, right? And this is what I did with my 18-year-old just, just yesterday. She said, when I get my money, Dad, what do I do with it? I said, well, first you give 10%, and then you're going to save 10%, and then the other 80% we'll work on. You can spend that however you want. You don't have living expenses. You don't have rent right now. You don't have to pay for food. So you can use those dollars how you want. Maybe you're saving a whole lot more than 10%, but at a minimum, you're giving 10, you're saving long-term 10, you're just forgetting about it, and then the other 80, you're allocating, okay? And so now we're gonna get into the other, other 80%. Um, so 30% should be housing. Yes, ma'am. Um, sorry, I had a question about, so for monthly net income, am mm -hmm. I taking my income after taxes and dividing by 12? Yes, I was thinking that. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> you're taking your. That's exactly. That's a great question. That's a great question. So you're taking. So you're. And yeah, that's a super duper question. Chris. Yes. Would it be helpful if you just wrote that out as an example? Oh yeah, let's do that. There's a reason why Mrs. Hayworth is in charge. Should we use? What kind of income should we use? Let's use fifty thousand. That's easy. For me. Yeah. Well, yeah. I didn't know what you were asking, sorry. No, any income. Oh, sure. I would do more like 30,000. I did 37. I did 38. Okay. I did 30. Oh, see, we can't do 38 because that's, that math is just way too high. <laughs> 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 I'm just teasing. That's good. Do it. I'm gonna, let's do 30, okay? You guys with me on that? Just, just for the math, because I'm... Ooh, 30 hard. It's not hard. Okay, <laughs> so this would be, we don't have, so this is, the, this is our income. <clears throat> And taxes, we said, taxes and all the other icky stuff that you have to pay for, we said 20%, right? So let's, let's put that down. I, I think that's, that's rough. Um, but that's what? $6,000, right? So we subtract that because that's so money that we don't get. So we're left with, in the box, in the box, we're left with, uh, yeah, that's a great you know what? Who made this sheet? This is, did this. It wasn't me. It had to be somebody else. So two thousand a month. So it'd be twenty-four thousand. Yeah, that's what they call class. Yeah, or what they're really asking is two thousand dollars a month. Yeah. So there you go. So that's what's in the box. If you're thirty thousand. Yep. And if we tied off, if we tied off the gross, it would be three hundred a month. But if we're tying off the net, then we just go ahead and do. Perfect. 200. That's perfect. You're exactly right. So let's do, for this purpose, let's go 300, okay? We're big givers. Bigger blessings. How would I do this? Tied off your growth so you don't have to worry about tithing when you get that income check. <laughs> so this is this is per month, okay? So we're giving <laughs> 300, and then we're saving. We're, we'll give off of our net, okay? I'm, I'm sorry, we'll save off of our net, so net is after taxes, and you know that's what we get in our paycheck. So we're gonna save 200, yeah? We'll see how this works. This isn't gonna work out, I don't think, because I'm giving too much, but we'll, we'll make it work. God will supply everything Oh, else. man, here, take the marker and teach the class, and I'm done, my job is done here. All right, so housing, 30%, uh, so that is off of the 24,000, what did I do? That, I didn't do this right. I screwed up already. Okay. It should be 20. No. Oh, You're that's right. right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't screw up. So this should be how much per month for housing? 30% of 2,000 is 600. So that means if you're going to get a mortgage, 
or you're going to rent an apartment. I don't know. And I've got, I've got everything in here. Okay, if you look in here, and this could be, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where you're going to live. This is <laughs> yeah, this could, this could really change things too. If you've got a really expensive cell phone bill, I, I rolled that right in here. Okay, um, it's all your utilities. It's everything that you've got, all in six hundred dollars. See, this is where God supplies everything else. Like a roommate. Yeah. Well, there. Really there you go. I'm a grown up. <laughs> <laughs> you are married. You get benefits with your roommate. <laughs> food, 10% is how much for food? Nothing. I spent all my money on rent. <laughs> Do it. Do it. No. I do that. So $200 per month for food. Transportation. So that's if you've got a vehicle, you've got a car payment. You're using public transportation. You're walking. You've got gas. You know, all the stuff that comes with having a vehicle. Car insurance. You've got all that. Ten per, I'm sorry. 15% is... 300, 300, right? I hope if I don't get this right. We might have to that week. Okay, then we've got debt, debt repayment. So we talked to, you know, you know, student loans are are out there. But debt is five hundred. I'm sorry, five percent. And we know five percent of two thousand dollars a month is hundred dollars, right? And we've got insurance. So this just could be some other other insurances. We've got five percent there. We know five percent is a hundred. Clothing. How many of you like to buy clothes? All oh, women raise their hand. Okay. That's not right. I like to buy clothes. Too. All right, hundred dollars for clothes per month. I'm like what? How would you do that? And then we've got recreation entertainment. Nothing. Charge. <laughs> Charge on the side. 5%. And we're off here because I'm giving a little bit more, but we've got medical and dental, so those are expenses that sometimes aren't covered. Again, if you've got a great benefits package, if they provide dental insurance and you've got great medical, you may pay very little. You know, I know the education world, if you're going to be a teacher, they do a fantastic job. Oftentimes you can go to see a doctor and a dentist and you don't have to pay a dime. That's awesome. So then all of a sudden, you don't have to worry about any of this. I think we're off by 100 bucks here. But I think it gives you the idea. So hopefully, this all, it doesn't, but this will add up to $2,000 a month. That's the whole idea behind, behind this. Okay, so this gives you a plan for how much you can spend. So all of a sudden now, if, if you've found this beautiful apartment that overlooks the water, it's $900 a month, and you're making $30,000 a year, can you afford that apartment? Yeah, you can't. You can't do it. You can't do it. Or you have to be more creative and you find a roommate or two or three. <laughs> right? So you find ways. So this gives you a plan to make things happen. Now, if you're fortunate, I shared this story before. I think it's the coolest story and it changes. Oh, and I, I messed this up. Here we go. We're going to zip through food, transportation. There we go. We're caught up. Here we go. And this is good too. You guys are going to like this. Why are they so happy? Guess what? It saves money. Because <laughs> anticipation's killing you. Because we have a budget. Look how happy they are. It took a long. <laughs> anticipation. You like that? All right. Um, I, t I told this story before. I, I'm sorry, I, Mr. Melton. I'm sure so sorry or tired of hearing about this story, but it's such a cool story. It's a Dave Ramsey story. I love it because it's it's real, and it's nothing out of the ordinary from what you you guys could do. Um, and I, like I said, the numbers change each time. I forget exactly, so I fudge the numbers a little bit here. But the principle's right. There were two uh, young man and woman got married right after right out of college. I believe they were both teachers. And they both received, I don't know if they were making, it wasn't $50,000 a year. It might have been 40 something thousand a year. Okay, so they, as a couple, they were doing pretty doggone good. Making $80,000 a year right out, of, right out of school. They were resolved to not have debt. They, didn't, they wanted to just not be in debt. And so Dave Ramsey says that, I think it's cool how he says it. He says, you have to be willing to live like no one else, 
So later on in life, you can live like no one else, right? So early on after college, if you're living like no one else, that means you're living in a pretty unglamorous way compared to what a lot of your classmates, a lot of people you graduate are going to be living. Yes, sir? Um, I don't know how to just, uh, I'm pretty skeptical of Dan Ramsey, especially because of the way that he earns money out of the advice that he gives people just in like, and not like, just like being debt free, like that's cool advice. And I'm also skeptical of like this idea of like uh, frugality, because in general, like this live like no one else is the idea that um, people are like lowering their normal like means of living or whatever. And in general, it seems like being frugal is a privilege that people have. Whereas like uh, there are like many people who are like already living like no one else, you yeah. know, coming out of it, like they have to live like this already. And yeah. so this isn't just like, oh, I'm making this conscious decision to already like live frugally. Um, and so I just think yeah, I took, I totally like get a lot of this. I just think that like, um, I don't think that like, I don't know. Uh, sometimes it feels like we're like, okay, we need to like cut out some of these things from our lives, but like, what if those things are already cut out of our lives? That's and yeah. you know, what if like, you know, exiting college, like, you know, they were making 80,000 together. I don't think that's everyone's story. And as we see like markets like decrease uh, for like in some like job areas and that sort of thing, I guess it's, it's like really hard like for me to see like, you know, I think like all of this works in theory when like if I can exit college and I can have a job and a job that gives me enough to make a budget out of and a job that makes me enough so that I can like be frugal with the money that I'm earning. But what happens when I exit college and I have debt and I don't have the kind of job that allows me to like make sacrifices on things because I'm already yeah. making lots of sacrifices. And I, I don't know, I think that's a reality of a lot of people's situation. And it's kind of hard because- that's like, a, oh, you're, you're, you're great, yeah. I mean, how great, I, I just shared with Mr. Melton the, the example that you guys got le, uh, last week showed two job offers of 50 some thousand dollars a year, right? And I shared with him, I said, I, what an awesome problem to have. I mean, I, I wouldn't even care after college. If somebody's offering me a position like that, I'm going to say, okay, I'll take it. doesn't matter. I, I'll take it, you know, because it, it is tough. But I think what you have, and you maybe you have yourselves to thank, or I'm sure there, there are family members and other people to thank, for you being here today to be at, I'm a Spring Arbor homer. I love Spring Arbor. I graduated from here. Um, I, I don't think I take this for granted. This is an incredible institution. It doesn't. It's not a cheap place to go. So sure. there's somebody somewhere making a lot of sacrifice for you to be here. And you are well ahead of a lot of people in having this opportunity to be here. And if you have a degree, your chance, it's not guaranteed. You know, it's not guaranteed that you're going to get a job earning this, this money. You know, you're, you're not. But it sure does give you a step in that direction. That's the goal, right? By you being here, helping you have the potential or to earn an income that's better than if you didn't come here. And there are certainly people, a lot of times they're, they're not victims of their own circumstance. Sometimes stuff happens and they don't have this income, right? They don't, they don't have that luxury. They are just getting by. Um, and that's a whole nother discussion, but I think that's where a lot of times if you're able and you're able to do some of this stuff, that's where we can help in some ways. I mean, that's, I mean, we're not, you know, we don't, uh, I hope you just take where I'm going with this and not say this is what we're here to do uh, exclusively, but that's where giving comes into play. If we can help, if there's a, a need like that, um, that's, that's, if we're financially successful, I think that's the ultimate goal is to be able to give so other people can be successful as well. But I, I appreciate what you're saying. I know this seems really rosy, and the goal is that you guys all do have an income. I mean, that's, that's the goal. And believe it or not, you're going to. There's gonna be an income that you're gonna get, even though it seems like that may be so far away, but it, it's gonna happen. Right. I thank you, for, I'm glad that you felt comfortable to share that. Yeah. Well, just to speak to like what Elijah is saying, like I've been living off faith for it feels like like seven or eight years, and it's really frustrating because you're like, oh Lord, when I'm gonna have to pay for stuff instead of just having to believe for stuff. But it's like since we are in a faith-based institution in a classroom, I think that 
I should negate to say that like giving does like make a difference. I've been giving like off my a 10% off my gross off everything that I've gotten and when I don't have like an income I've like made a commitment to the Lord that I'll every time I'll at least give five dollars like I won't give God any Thing less than five dollars and i've never gone without shelter i've never been on the side of the road i've never been naked and i've never been hungry and so where it, this does seem realist unrealistic in some areas and it does kind of and um like i have to have government like insurance right now because i'm a student and everything like that so everything isn't peachy and it isn't rosy but like god does take care of his children so that is something to definitely like put your like your faith in because all this is dust and it could blow away in every second but the only thing that we do is for the lord is what matters so do not skimp on your giving at all because god honors giving it's awesome awesome i mean i like I, I, class is over right that's it <laughs> um malachi 310 if you want a life changer i wasn't going to go here but malachi 310 is an incredible scripture verse if you want to build your foundation on a scripture verse specifically that deals with finances, that's a, that, that's totally a unique verse in scripture. You don't find the words in that verse anywhere else, but it talks about the Lord's provision for you. He's going to bless you. He's going to make sure you are cared for and all your needs are met. You'll open you up the window give. of heaven. So write that down. Look at that. That's a, that's a good verse. I'm going to go with, if, if you let me, allow me that privilege to go through the, the, the story. This couple, so fill in, you know, fill in the blanks with whatever it is, okay? They, these, this couple was actually a real couple, able to earn a pretty good income. They chose, they, they were resolved to not want to have a debt. And so I think it was for, I don't know, it was for five years or something crazy like that. They were fortunate to find someone from their church who had an apartment above their garage, or it was a room, not apartment necessarily, but they had a spare space, and they allowed this couple to live there for little to nothing. Okay, so they were married. And a lot of people think that when I get married, I need to buy the house and I need to have the life, you know, the perfect life. I need to have the car and the dogs and the whatever. This couple said, we're not going to do that. We are going to be a married couple and we're going to live with another person. Um, and that's not always, you know, when, you, when you're married, you want to live your life and you want to start your life together. But they chose to live above the garage for several years and they squirreled away pretty much everything. They didn't have a lot of these expenses, so they were able to save a whole lot of money and then the bottom line with this is they ended up over that five-year period they ended up saving $150,000 cash and again they lived very very modestly to say the least and so then at, at the point where they felt like they were ready they ended up pulling $100,000 out of that account wherever it was they had it saved they bought a house cash you know, I think a pretty modest house, but enough for certainly two people, $100,000 cash, and then they took $50,000 and they furnished it. So they had furniture and all this stuff, and they didn't have debt. So, you know, you you can tier that with your income, whatever that is, but the whole point there is if, if you really resolve to do it, there's there's a way to make that happen. Are you going to be able, is everybody going to be able to do that and have the fortune of being able to live rent-free for five years or want to live in a place like that for five years? Probably not, but boy, if, if you have that option, if you're able and willing to do that, you can do some pretty special things. While a lot of friends have car payments and house payments or paying rent, and, and, and you don't have to do it that way. You don't have to do it. Yeah. Can we talk a second about a realistic like car payment? Yeah. Like right now, I have a car that I clearly don't have a car note on, but it could die any day. And if I have a job now, like what should I be considering, how much to like put away for a down payment, and what's like a realistic car, monthly car payment? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I don't know, I, I'm, this is probably my personal, I, I, don't, I don't drive new cars. I've never had a new car. I'm 40-ish years old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a new car. I'm not a huge believer in them. I don't like to have car payments. So my wife and I, we save money every month in a fund that hopefully will get us to the place where we can buy a good used car somewhere well, down the line. But I, so we've, we've resolved to work that into our budget and we drive the vehicle I have right now is, um, <laughs> it gets me from point A to point B, you know? Um, but if you need to buy a car, I don't know, you can get so many deals that are 0% 
interest for a lot of years, but new cars are so expensive. Even with that, you could pay up to $500 a month. It depends on the car. So um, with that being said, how much should we, because uh, I've never driven a new car anyway, mm -hmm. and I don't want to adjust to having a car payment. So what is a good amount to have stored away for when you need to buy another like used car? Yeah. Like how much money does a good used car buy? Because so far I've just been on like these $1,600 junkers. So. Yeah. I like, mean, what's one I can feel safe in? Yeah, that's such a great, I don't know, that's, that's don't ask me that question. <laughs> that's a hard, that's hard, because you can get, um, I've got a friend here in Spring Arbor who buys my vehicles for me. He goes out and he's able to get vehicles kind of at a wholesale price, and sometimes we're paying five, six thousand dollars for a vehicle. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's, they're, they're not great long term, but, you know, I'm able to get my car backed into and have my bumper wrecked, and I don't worry a whole lot about it, you know? Um, so about five or six thousand. I, pretty yeah, good. I don't know. And some people, so there might be some one of you in here saying you are crazy, Chris. You can't get a vehicle for that amount. But you know, you can. You know, some brand new trucks these days, you're spending forty to fifty thousand dollars on these crazy things. I know. You know? I hear like so, you can go to like an auction or something like yeah. that. But that was like what I was thinking. Like, if I'm putting away money every month to have like a decent down payment, I can take that down payment and get like another like new car, Absolutely like can. a few years old. But like, how much? Should you have put away for? Yeah, that's such a good question. Most places, most, most, I mean, there's a lot, it depends on the your dealership. They don't require a down payment even. They just want to make sure you have a steady income and they'll finance you, which isn't always the best way to go. But if you want to buy debt. it, it's, it's debt. Yeah, you're exactly right. So if you can get away with out having that, it's great. But it does take some foresight now in having those dollars set aside. And if you can get five to six to seven thousand dollars set aside, you should be able to get a pretty decent car that's going to last you. A while that's going to get you to and from work yeah but but don't you think it's a bit risky buying a used car for like that price then what if something happens to it cars not easy to fix versus like you leasing a car and if it goes wrong you can take the bill you, you're right I and mean, we could we could have that conversation you're, you're exactly right i understand completely you're out there too i think it comes down each person's situation is different it, it has to fit i think if it fits here oops, <laughs> you know, there's some people, man, if you're making an income, buy a brand new car. If you've got an income, buy a, buy a brand new car, you can afford it. But for most people right out of college, you, you just, you know, newer cars, generally you're going to pay more for car insurance. So there's that expense that you have to look into also. I know there's no right answer. I, I get, I'm giving my personal stuff. I just like having, um, I just don't like having a payment. I don't like having a payment. Um, and I, but I know there are some good, there's some good deals out there too. And I think you have to have good counsel. And you have to talk to somebody that really knows you and that you trust. And not that the car dealers aren't people you can trust, but what is their primary goal? To so a car, right? <coughs> Man, you look good in that. I can, you, I can see you in there. You know, so you find people that you that you love and trust and that can give you some counsel. And there, that's there's scripture there too. Um, I'm going to get there maybe, but um, a lot to cover here in six minutes. I want to go one more place, okay? Um, this art I read this article that you guys were to read, this article about student loan consolidation. Long article, right? Not necessarily a real page turner, but um, <laughs> there's some good stuff. If you were able to get to the bottom of that article, the last part of that article, I thought there was some good stuff because it went, it went right here. And I'm going to give you a Dave Ramsey again, okay? I think this is, I think this is awesome. And I love this. I don't know if it's because when I was a little boy, I grew up watching this show called, um, what was it called? Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, mm -hmm. right? Before Discovery Channel was their animal planet. You always love seeing, it was this animal show, and you love seeing the cheetahs chase the gazelles, right? It was always so fun. It was so cool. And so when I heard this analogy, um, I, it just it stuck with me. So it, another thing, another nugget that I think you, I want you to take with you is when you've got debt, if you've got student loans, and this, this article speaks to this in a lot of ways. It says you should pay as much as you can afford, make extra payments when you can, pay off the loan with the highest interest rate first. There's so many good nuggets here. The bottom line here is if you've got debt of any sort, including student loans, and you're fortunate to not have some of these big expenses, I would say as much as you can, as soon as you can, approach that debt and try to pay that debt off with gazelle-like intensity. And when you say that, 
what what is this little dude and look at the look on his face what is he thinking right now i'm gonna get eight i got it i'm gonna get eight unless i get out of here right i have got to get out of here because if i don't and i'm not serious about getting out of here i'm i'm done you know and so there's an intensity that he has that is unlike any other intensity and for that matter right he's got that same intensity because if he doesn't get that gazelle what happens to him he doesn't eat for the day right so in some ways they're equally intense and that's how you should approach your death when you're trying to eliminate debt you approach it with the intensity of this guy you do everything you can in your power to get rid of that anything you can almost like it's a life or death situation if you approach it that way the sooner you can get rid of that the sooner you can move on with with some of this stuff. Okay? So I want you to, analogies help me a lot, and I, I, like, I want you to think of that. I've got so much stuff here. Um, make sure you know, like, you know, if you have a bad hair day, nobody needs to tell you you're having a bad hair day, right? Nobody ever tells me that. If you're having a bad hair day, you know it. You don't want to look in the mirror and have, have somebody else tell you that. And this is kind of what this is. This is your mirror right here. Sometimes when you have student loans, the easiest thing to do is just not look in the mirror. I don't even want to know how much I have. I know I've got a lot, just don't even tell me about it. But the first step to fixing that is knowing how much, how much you have. And this is a great warehouse. It's a great site. I think it's the National Student Loan Data System. I think that's right. And it's a place where you can plug in some of your personal information, and it, it will tell you exactly what you uh, what you have out there as far as loans go. Because you can start getting a lot of loans. Some of them are, you know, federal loans, some subsidized, unsubsidized, personal loans, Parent Plus loans. You can have all kinds of stuff out there. This is a great place to know how much you owe. Because the only way you're going to be able to get a handle on that and be able to approach that with that gazelle-like intensity is to know what you're facing first. Know your enemy, know what you're up against, and then you can put a plan in place to, to eliminate that. Okay, so write that down. Maybe that could be a resource that you could use at some point in the future just to know how much you've got there. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I've got too much. Um, I'll show you one thing, okay? One more thing. Oops. I've got so much here. Do I have just a few more minutes? Okay, I'll give you this. And that is what? Anybody know what that is? Small money. That's your money? It's a, it's a debt snowball, right? Debt snowball. I want to give you one, one way of, and there's a lot of ways that you can eliminate your debt. I think this is a cool one. And it, I had wanted to build up to something like this, but we're running out of time here. This is a cool way, if you've got some debt, this is a cool way, I think, of eliminating that debt. There's some people, one way is actually paying off, and, and the article that you guys were to read uh, says, you should, and this is a good way, you should pay the debt that has the highest interest rate. Right, why do you want to do that? So you have the more Yeah, higher the interest rate, the more interest you have to pay, so eliminate that one first, that, that's, that makes sense. That, that's a good way. This is another way, um, and I like it because it, it's not necessarily financial, it's more psychological, but create a list of all your debts, whatever you have, write down the balance that you owe on each one of those, and now, instead of paying the highest interest, that this is kind of a cool strategy, it's whatever works for you, it says now reorder the, your debts from smallest to largest. So I, if I have a $200 balance on my Target card and you know they move on down to larger student loans, this is saying, Pay the minimum payment on all of the debts except your smallest one. So on that Target card, is Target issue cards? I think yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, they do. I got. I know that. I got. No. Um, it says now. It says take every dollar you can, every dollar that you have with gazelle intensity, and put it towards that smallest debt, not the one with the highest interest rate. Put it towards the smallest debt, and then it says celebrate like crazy when you get that first debt paid off. So maybe you can eliminate that one really quick, right? And then all of a sudden now you start to do the snowball. You start to take the dollars that you are use, you're using to pay off this small debt and you put it towards the next smallest debt. 
and all of a sudden you start creating a snowball effect. Now you get that second debt paid off and now you've got even more dollars that you were spending that you can put towards the next debt and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And the thing I like about this is this right here. It says you can celebrate like crazy when you get that first one paid off because there's this emotional benefit that comes with this one and saying, man, I paid it off, I did it. I eliminated that debt, it feels so good not to get that bill in the mail anymore and I've got that one taken care of. So that's, that's a pretty cool way to be able to pay off that debt. And there's so many ways to do this. I think it is, I'm going to commit to the Lord, whatever you do, and he'll establish your plans in Proverbs. I think this one is great too. Um, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Find somebody, again, that you love or trust. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a professor here. So, somebody that you just really respect and know has your best uh, interest at heart. Somebody that's successful. Man, if you want to be successful, you know what you do in life? Surround yourself with what kind of people? people. Successful people. Oh, yeah. Right? You don't want to be successful, guess who you associate yourself with? No. People that aren't successful. Right? You want to be successful, associate with successful people, find out what they're doing. Successful people love to tell their story and they want to help you. It's incredible. They want to help you. So if you want to be successful, do what successful people are doing. And that's what Proverbs is kind of saying. Be with advisors. It doesn't mean a paid advisor. I mean, we can do, my firm does things like that, but you don't necessarily need, you know, somebody like that. You need people that, that you love and trust and people that can come alongside you and, and help you through this. Because you're not expected to know it all, right? You're 20, 21, 22, you know quite a bit, especially after being here at Spring Harbor. But there's stuff that you don't know. You shouldn't be expected to. So rely on other people to help you through this. Okay? Associate with successful people because they're, they're going to help you through that. Um, and I've got a million other things, but I, 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 I want to be a resource for you. I, I hope in some way, maybe some teeny way, this was helpful for you. And it'll maybe, you'll kind of look back on this at some point And when you've got a paycheck coming in, and you'll think of some of these things. Um, get in touch with me if you've got questions. I, I, I do want to be a resource for you. Um, I'm right down the street. I live. Can you believe I live in Spring Arbor? There are people that actually live in Spring Arbor. You know, let's go to school here. I live here. Um, so if you ever have questions, give me a call. I would love to serve you in that way. My contact information, I think, is at the bottom. Yes. Yeah, it's at the bottom there. Um, I'd love to help if I can. And like I said, I'll leave you with this. If, um, I'll just say, if you want to be, if you want to be successful, chances are you're going to have to do things that most other people aren't doing. Because most people would say they're going to do something like this and they want to get off to a good start, but most people aren't. They'll say they will, but they won't. So if you want to be different, do, do some of these things. And it might feel like you're, it's crazy, and it might feel like you're different. And man, I shouldn't be doing that because, man, my buddy, my roommate's not doing that. He's, you know, he looks like he's doing great. And that's so much of it. Most people look like they're doing great. Reality, they've got payments everywhere and they're struggling with just how am I going to get through to next month? How am I going to do this? Right? It doesn't give you the opportunity to be generous when you need to. It doesn't give you the opportunity to save for your future. It doesn't give you the opportunity to plan for an emergency. You know, a lot of these people are one emergency away from being bankrupt. And that's the way most people live. That's the way to live. So if you want to be different, you want to be successful in that way, be different when you do some of these kinds of things. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Just a note. Yeah. 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 A way of doing it that Chris has provided us, but as you're thinking this through for next week, you may even want to make notes about kind of why, like what it is about your values that kind of are guiding you towards certain areas, and that way um, you can kind of approach it the way you feel best about it. The biggest goal of this is just intentionality, and that you're not stuck in that situation financially where you're, you know, in a place where you can have done some things. Some things are out of our control, but some things are. So that's the goal of this assignment and the time that Chris has provided for us. So um, 
we're really grateful for this time. And this, if you have questions about this, feel free to email any of us three about the assignment, and then we can be ready for next week. If you wouldn't mind to give us the pink sheet, too, to help us wrap up the class. Is there any final questions about anything?